On Thursday, January 16th, we saw the first ever launch of SpaceX's new and improved Starship Block 2 vehicle. While no one can deny that this rocket put on one hell of a show, it also failed catastrophically. So what happened there? Well, let's figure it out. In the lead up to Starship Flight Number 7, everything was looking beautiful at Starbase. We had nice late afternoon sunlight, clear skies, a little bit of wind, but nothing to be worried about. We're all very excited to get our first look at the capabilities of this upgraded V2 Starship vehicle. The pre-launch rundown showed off some new video of the ship's payload being fitted in through a slot on the back. Those are Starlink mass simulators, essentially just chunks of metal in the same shape and weight of a Starlink V3 satellite. Those are being loaded into the ship's PEZ dispenser for deployment while in space. This Block 2 Starship has been fitted with longer propellant tanks that hold 25% more volume than before, amounting to about 300 metric tons of additional rocket fuel to help carry that new payload weight. We also got a really cool look at the new heat shield tiles that are being tested on this launch. Yet again, SpaceX has made the call to remove several of the black hexagonal tiles from areas all over the body of the ship. They've also dedicated one section to experimenting with new metallic tiles, one of which has an active cooling system, which essentially means that cold liquid, probably rocket fuel, is being flowed through the tile to expel heat very similar to the water-cooled steel plate that's below the Starship during launch. And even though the Super Heavy booster for this launch is not a new design like the ship, there is something very special about this booster. It's been fitted with the Raptor engine that was previously flown in October 2024 on a Super Heavy that was caught by the Mechazilla Tower. Raptor number 314, the Pi engine, ready for round two. And on booster ignition, everything is going smoothly, we get all 33 Raptors igniting, and the rocket moves quickly off the pad. The sound on this stream is excellent. We get that very clear crackle from the rocket engines that comes from the exhaust plume breaking the sound barrier. We also get a much better downward facing camera angle this time. We can see more of the rocket body as it ascends, and that also gives us a view of this little piece of sheet metal on the far left side of the screen that seems to break loose and start flapping in the wind. Remember that one for later. But flappy metal aside, everything continues to go beautifully. We get a clean hot stage separation as the ship engines ignite with the booster still attached. The energy from those upper stage engines pushes the booster into a backflip maneuver, and shortly after that, we get our boost back burn. This time around, one of the middle ring engines fails to restart for the boost back, but that doesn't seem to bother SpaceX at all because we very quickly get the call out that booster is go for return to launch site. After making a final separation from the interstage ring that's clamped to the top of the booster, it gradually steers back towards Starbase. The heat from all of the air pressure built up underneath the booster as it freefalls makes the engine nozzles glow red, but that doesn't stop them from lighting up to begin the final landing burn. This time we get all 13 of the middle and center ring engines, so we've learned something new here. The engine that failed to restart for the boost back managed to fire up just fine for landing. And from here, we get a pretty spectacular view of the second ever Mechazilla chopstick arm catch of a super heavy booster. This time around looks much more clean than what we saw back in October, very minimal fire involved, just a bit of smoke coming off the booster, which would not be unusual given everything it just went through. This time around, the chopstick arms seem to close in on the booster much faster and more confidently than before. The SpaceX presenters mentioned earlier that the arms are now equipped with radar sensors to help in measuring the distance to the rocket. In the vast digital landscape, your privacy is as important as your safety in space. CyberGhost VPN is your shield against online threats, encrypting your data and keeping hackers, snoopers, and prying eyes at bay. With its military-grade security and a strict no-logs policy, your online activities remain completely private, just as they should be. But CyberGhost VPN doesn't stop at security. It gives you access to geo-restricted content from over 40 streaming platforms, so you can watch your favorite movies and shows from anywhere. It even helps you find better online shopping deals or play games unavailable in your region. With a single subscription, you can protect up to seven devices, so your entire crew, whether at home or on the go, stays safe. 
CyberGhost has over 38 million users and an excellent rating on Trustpilot, rated by over 20,000 users, so it's definitely one of the best VPNs in the world. Space Race viewers get an out-of-this-world deal, CyberGhost VPN for just $2.03 a month, plus four months free. That's 84% off with a 45-day money-back guarantee. So don't miss the chance to protect your online world and unlock its full potential. Click the link below and start your secure adventure today. And now, while we're all very distracted by another successful booster catch, things start to go very badly overhead on the ship stage. It was easy to miss, I've just got a note that I took reading, weird engine telemetry from ship at 8 minutes and 30 seconds. Turns out, this was a little more than just weird telemetry readings, which is clearly what our SpaceX presenters are hoping for, but if we take a closer look at how the information on screen plays out, we can watch the beginning of the end for the first Starship Block 2. At T plus 7 minutes 40 seconds, the first ship engine goes down. It's a Raptor boost in the center cluster of three engines. That's the same type of Raptor used on the Super Heavy booster for launch. At the time of the engine out, the ship is 141 kilometers above the Earth, traveling at 17,800 kilometers per hour. Shortly after that first engine dies, we can see another important clue in the little illustration of the Starship. This shows us the attitude, or angle, of the rocket, and we can see the nose begin to move in a downward direction. At T plus 755, we go back to a camera view from the ship. This is pointed directly at the backside of the rear flap, and if you look at the bottom edge of the frame, just to the right of the time clock, we can see a hinge mechanism. And if you look closely, you can see flames licking up from inside the starship and coming out through that hinge. This is not good. Even with all of this going on, Starship continues to gain speed and altitude. At 8 minutes 3 seconds, the second of the Raptor boost engines goes out. That's followed quickly by one of the outer ring vacuum engines going down. These are unique to the ship stage and have big wide nozzles for higher efficiency in the vacuum of space. We are now at 144 km altitude and 20,000 km per hour. Looking closely again at the telemetry, we can see that the angle of the ship is now totally flat. The nose is no longer pointing up, and it starts to even pitch down a little bit back towards the Earth. At the same time, we can see that the ship is depleting its methane tank at a much higher rate than its oxygen. At 8.18, the second Raptor Vac engine goes out. The ship is 145 km altitude, 21,000 km per hour. The nose actually begins to pitch back up towards the correct angle, but then we lose the third center boost engine at 824. The methane tank is now showing nearly empty. The telemetry then freezes at T plus 8 minutes 27 seconds and shows the rocket at an altitude of 146 kilometers. From here, there's a very short-lived mystery about what happened to the Starship, but thanks to the X platform, we quickly start to uncover amateur videos that capture the truth. The ship blew up in space, and quite spectacularly too. Apparently, there was at least two Caribbean cruise ships below the rocket at the point of explosion, and this is what the passengers on board were able to see. It's obviously very far away, but we can make out that there was a trail of fire being dragged behind the ship in the seconds before the big boom, which sends a massive cloud of gas out into the upper atmosphere. And we can also make out that one big chunk of rocket actually continues to fly straight after the explosion. Best that we can tell, the explosion didn't happen at the same moment that telemetry froze from the ship, but it probably coasted for about two minutes after that point before blowing up, so this would be around T plus 11 minutes. For what comes next, we can flip over to video captured by people on the ground on the islands of Dominican Republic and Turks and Caicos. This is pretty spectacular. The clouds of debris from Starship has hit the atmosphere and is raining down streaks of orange fire across the evening sky. It's beautiful to watch, but why did that happen? Well, remember our little piece of flappy metal? That was a red herring. It had nothing to do with the ship exploding. This is part of a cover on the side of the ship. It's a raised section just below the catch pin that has a dark keyhole shape on the middle. That keyhole is the point where the chopstick support brackets slot into the ship. 
These triangular supports that hang down below the main arms are just there to prevent the ship and booster from swaying around when they're being lifted up. So that little bit of metal that came loose is not part of the ship's actual body, it's just an extra bit that was tacked on, and not very well. So now we can get back to the real culprit. We know that there were engines out and fire in the lower segment of the ship. That flap hinge where we saw the flames licking out is located just above the engines and below the main oxygen tank. Bad place to have excess fire. So from this point on, the ship is doomed, and without engines, it's going to be heading way off course from where it's supposed to be. So it wouldn't be crazy to think that what we saw was a self-destruction. This wouldn't be the first time that Starship has had to activate the flight termination system. Now at this point, it's worth contemplating which is worse, letting the ship fall down in one giant piece or blasting it into a million tiny pieces. Honestly, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm guessing they know what they're doing. But it's also possible that this explosion was totally beyond the control of SpaceX, which might explain how we ended up with that one big chunk continuing on after the blast. The self-destruct is designed to explode the rocket as completely and efficiently as possible. It probably wouldn't leave that much behind. As always, we turn to Elon Musk for the answers. And after a period of radio silence, Elon starts to deliver. His first response on X reads, improved versions of the ship and booster already waiting for launch, ever the optimist. Then he follows up with a more technical explanation. Preliminary indication is that we had an oxygen fuel leak in the cavity above the ship engine firewall that was large enough to build pressure in excess of the vent capacity. Apart from obviously double checking for leaks, we will add fire suppression to that volume and probably increase vent area. Nothing so far suggests pushing next launch past next month. So that lines up with what we saw ourselves. The fire that came out through the hinge was trapped in between a shield that's placed at the top of the engine nozzle and the bottom of the oxygen tank. That fire killed off the engines one by one until the pressure built up too high and boom. Of course, now everyone is wondering, what will the federal regulators say about this one? We can see clearly that the Starship explosion had a disruptive effect on commercial airlines, flight trackers show multiple jets were redirected to avoid the debris field, which would indicate that there was an amount of debris that fell outside of the airspace that had already been closed for Starship. Meaning, stuff ended up where it wasn't supposed to be. And that's further reinforced by new reports that relatively large pieces of Starship debris have been found on the islands of Turks and Caicos. An initial statement from the Federal Aviation Administration reads, The FAA is aware an anomaly occurred during the SpaceX Starship Flight 7 mission that launched from Boca Chica, Texas on January 16th. The FAA is assessing the operation and will issue an updated statement. The agency then followed up the next day by reporting that a mishap investigation into Starship Flight 7 has been initiated. This effectively grounds any Starship activity until the investigation is concluded. The agency wrote in a statement on Friday, a return to flight is based on the FAA determining that any system, process, or procedure related to the mishap does not affect public safety. Meanwhile, outgoing NASA Administrator Bill Nelson doesn't seem too worried about it. He wrote on X, congrats to SpaceX on Starship's seventh test flight and the second successful booster catch. Spaceflight is not easy, it's anything but routine. That's why these tests are so important, each one bringing us closer on our path to the moon and onward to Mars through Artemis. So we know that SpaceX has some work to do on their next Starship block before trying that again, and it means that Flight 8 is going to have to be a do-over for all of the tests that were supposed to have been done but never made it. We'll see how things shake down with the feds, but it's looking right now like this is just a minor setback in the much bigger mission of Starship. Thanks again to CyberGhost VPN for sponsoring this video. Be sure to take advantage of their incredible deal right now using the link down below in the description.